Hello and welcome to this uh, first event. My name is uh, Colm Kilcorfield. I'm the head of the Department of Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics here at the University of Cambridge, which of course is one of the two constituent departments of uh, the Faculty of Mathematics with our sister department, uh, Department of Pure Mathematics and Mathematical Statistics. And I'm very glad that you've all joined us here today to hear about uh, some of the recent uh, exciting activities we've had uh, in applying mathematics to healthcare. Now, of course, the Faculty of Mathematics at the University of Cambridge is a very large uh, organisation. There's about 120 uh, academic staff involved in the teaching. There's maybe 130 uh, researchers, uh, over 300 uh, PhD students uh, now. And we have typically, of course, 250 students in each of our undergraduate uh, uh, years. And then in the part three, the famous uh, master's level course, we have also, again, 250 students. Indeed, this year, we have uh, had had over a thousand applications from outside to come in and take this uh, amazing course. Now, of course, our teaching is a key part of what we do, but also our research. Now, the name tells you that we have a, a long-standing tradition of interest in theoretical physics, as well as in applied mathematics. And our traditional strengths in uh, fluid mechanics, continuum mechanics, and uh, numerical analysis has really diversified over the last uh, few uh, years. And in particular, we've got very much involved in um, mathematics related to health issues, life sciences, uh, sustainability. And so, and we have a very large uh, research activity with typically about uh, 20 million pounds uh, per year of external research funding. And today, what I really, we really thought would be nice for you to hear about was to hear about some of the activities of three of uh, my colleagues here in uh, DAMT, uh, who have been looking at various aspects of how you can use mathematical skills and mathematical expertise to address important problems in healthcare. And of course, at the moment, they're exceptionally topical to do that. So I guess the first uh, speaker that I'd like to uh, introduce is uh, Professor Julia Gogg, who is a professor of mathematical biology here in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. Hi, Julia. Uh, Hi, very Colin. glad uh, to see you. So I thought it would be uh, a natural first question to ask you is uh, just tell us a bit about yourself and in particular about your research interests. Oh, so, um, professor of Mathematical Biology, but the bit within that is anything to do with the maths of infectious diseases. And then within that, for a long time, it's been um, influenza. So I started off thinking about multiple strains, how you get, you know, you go from SIR to thinking about more than one disease in that. And then that led me to thinking about flu evolution, where you've got multiple strains interacting and then the patterns that emerge from that. And then from that, I ended up thinking about within host dynamics of influenza, between host dynamics and then spatial dynamics, particularly within the 2009 pandemic. So really um, all aspects of uh, influenza, if there's a mathematical model to be made, I'm interested in that. Okay, so uh, of course, uh, infectious diseases have uh, more recently become really quite uh, topical. And uh, I don't want to embarrass you, but of course, uh, in the October 2020, you were given uh, an OBE for services to academia and the COVID-19 response. So could you tell us a bit about how you got entrained into the COVID-19 response? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think my, my research area is far too topical. It's, it's not good when the pandemic modelling is topical, really, uh, and too exciting for now. Um, so there's an organisation called SPIM, which is the modelling group for um, pandemic influenza that um, normally sits within Department of um, Health and Social Care. Um, and I joined into that really sort of after doing some of the BBC pandemic work. This was a, a project we had, which was a, a mix of um, new research and outreach all at the same time, sort of um, mass citizen science collecting a big data set, which could be used to better understand how people move and mix with each other in the UK, which we could get set up and use 20 years down the line for when we have the next pandemic or whatever. Um, but it all happened uh, much sooner than we'd hoped, of course. Um, as part of the BBC pandemic work, we, we made a very, very detailed model of the UK and how um, influenza-like pandemic would spread. 
And to be fair, it was completely over the top. It was something which was um, shown maybe for a few seconds in a, in a documentary once, but the model behind it uh, was incredibly detailed. But with that in hand, um, uh, I was asked to join SPYM, which is this, this group. It's mostly um, in peacetime, it's a very small group with only a few um, independent academics on it. The rest are Department of Health and Public Health England and so forth. And um, I'd understood it to be a very low commitment group normally, um, but of course would be uh, switched into operational mode for a pandemic. And, and that's of course where we are with um, SPYM now. Right, so yes, uh, I, um, I remember very well getting the letter as, you, as we've uh, both described it, asking uh, for you to be uh, effectively released from your duties uh, in, the, in the university to work on, on this uh, full time. And I know from our, our touching base conversations, you're, you're unbelievably busy with this process. So can you kind of give us an idea of what the work is like when you're working for SPYM and informing the government? It's really, uh, it's a really varied work. Um, there's been, I, I don't want to even think about how many meetings we've had within government groups and also within the scientific um, collaborators groups feeding into those. I mean, the main thing I'm doing is within SPYM and groups feeding into SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, there's, you know, lots of subgroups that feed into that and then that pulls it all together. But it's still really hands-on um, modelling work um, I mean, it, even this morning I presented something at SPIM that was, you know, me doing the number crunching. Um, actually, that was really nice because that was using um, uh, eigen, dominant eigenvectors from mixing matrix to talk about what the age distribution of cases and hospitalizations have been recently and what they could be going forward and whether it matches up. The really cute thing was that that was using the BBC pandemics mixing matrix again, so it tied it back in. So it can be really hands on jobs like that, which is, you know, a one off, but I might come back to it in a few weeks. Um, it can be quite responsive, right? So what comes to SAGE are uh, asks, basically. Uh, it's not just tell us about science of COVID, it's usually quite specific. So you can uh, work out that at the moment, the key one is about step four unlocking that's been postponed. Um, and can we now unpostpone it or something different happens? And it's very, very specific on that, so advise on that. And it's really, maybe you'd imagine it to be, you know, us saying what we think should happen, but it never is quite that. It's more like, what would happen if we unlock now? What would happen if we don't? What happens if this? So we have to try and um, give our understanding of what could happen. And also, of course, try and highlight which of the uncertainties actually matter in all of this. That's that's the sort of picture of what we're up to at the moment, really. And and how was this group of people assembled? Oh, informally, I suppose. Um, so Spy M had some long-standing uh, people on it, um, but as we went into operational mode, it was really all hands to the pumps. So we got uh, more people on board that were disease modelers that we knew that could bring relevant expertise and had some time to be able to contribute to it. Of course. Um, in March 2020, everyone wanted to do everything they could. Um, we've pulled some of this together to um, make a consortium called uh, Juniper, the Joint Universities Pandemic and Epidemiological Response, which um, is seven universities and even within those multiple research groups working together. Um, so it's, it's very, very ultra collaborative. It's not just sort of one research group doing something or a small number. There's many, many research groups. and Really, one of the super powerful things from Spy M, and we're taking it into our science and future for sure, is um, building a consensus from lots of groups, taking a diverse approach is really much, much more powerful than having one, you know, ridiculously de detailed single approach. And it's also fast, right? So you can get a consensus quickly rather than testing one approach repeatedly. Yeah, that sort of emergence of a of a consensus from many from the ensemble of many different uh, modelers uh, seems a very kind of appealing conceptually to at least to a mathematician way to approach things. So 
you know, this was obviously a, a, a terrible emergency. And as you say, all hands uh, to the pump kind of thing. What do you see the future for disease modeling or, or your type of uh, applied mathematics as we go out, hope God willing, out of this uh, emergency phase, but then into more a sort of vigilance phase and looking for the next, the next one? Well, I hope the next one's not going to be for a long, long time. And of course, we've got lots of work to do on this, looking at what happened um, and what could have happened and to, to you know lessons learned from this is going to be a massive job for my field but i don't think my field's going to look the same now as it did going into 2020 uh, at all it's completely different um, there's lots of ways we've we've grown um, but certainly the collaborative um, cross many groups element is one that we are going to keep i mean juniper is going to continue uh, into the future to be prepared for other responses and whatever we need for and maybe one of the other things that's really reshaped our field is, is the way we communicate about what we do, right? So um, the relationship with the media and epidemiology has been a complex one for the last 17 months. Um, but one of the things we've started to get right is to just communicate directly ourselves, right? So uh, with our consortium, we've actually got the Plus magazine from Millennium Maths Project actually built in uh, as part of our consortium. So Marianne and Rachel are there in our meetings um, and seeing the research at the leading edge as it happens. So this can be sort of written up and shared for wider audience. Of course, it is super interesting for wider audience at the moment. But that's something which I think we will keep into the future. And maybe it's something which other fields might be interested in sort of having inbuilt science writing to get the communications right throughout. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. That it, that... And, and also that was kind of the, the network that was available to you, you know, because the Millennium Maths Project is based here and has got such long-standing experience of this sort of outreach and science communication, it was then kind of ready off the shelf for you to plug it in to, to this uh, sort of need. And then maybe just in, in, in closing, I, you know, because we, we have also discussed this as well. I mean, this, your field is obviously so important but, it's, but it was, has been relatively small. You know, there is, there is a capacity issue with the number of people who are, who are trained and working in this area. Oh my goodness, yeah. We, we, we were, <laughs> it seemed like quite a big field until we were faced with a pandemic like this. And we simply, you know, ran out of hands to do um, a lot of the tasks that were needed of the data crunching and getting things out early on. And um, I'm hoping Paul will talk a little bit about the, the RAMP initiative rapid assistance in modeling the pandemic, uh, which was uh, convened and chaired by Mike Cates of DAMT, of course. And that was a way for um, wider mathematicians and people with appropriate expertise to sort of join us to offer assistance, to be seconded to spy M groups and just to help. Um, but yeah, we, we were too small to do everything that was needed early on. And it's a, it gets a little easier over the time when you realize you can partition things up between research groups to some extent. Um, but certainly capacity that we need for, you know, response in a sort of very data heavy pandemic is going to be different in the future. Great. So uh, I, I forgot to mention, because I'm not uh, born to this, that, uh, of course, please, uh, all participants, please do ask us questions and we'll, we'll come at the end to a, to a Q&A. But as, thank you, Julia. But as you said, this might be a good moment to, to start talking to, the, to our next colleague, uh, Professor Paul Linden. So Paul can turn on his camera. And his mic. Hi, Paul. Hi, hi Colin. So uh, this is uh, uh, Paul Linden, who is the uh, D.I. Taylor Professor of Flu Mechanics Emeritus here in, uh, in Dant. And as Julia said, was, uh, uh, has had a lot of involvement with RAMP, the Royal Society uh, activity that spun up to do with um, uh, the COVID uh, crisis. But of course, that's not uh, your own, uh, your only st string to your bow, Paul. So uh, maybe also too, just for you to start off, could you talk a bit about your research interests? Yeah, sure, Colin. So, so it started for me when I uh, moved from the country in South Australia to finish my high school education in Adelaide and live by the beach for the first time in my life. And I became fascinated by the ocean um, and uh, in particular uh, was a keen surfer. Uh, like to study waves and I had the fantastic uh, job as a student 
of doing the local surf report for the local radio station, which meant going and looking at the surf on a regular basis. So I got very interested in, in, in waves and the ocean, and oceanography. And then I learned, of course, that actually the interesting things happen under the surface, uh, much more than on top, um, although interesting things do happen on the surface, obviously. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, like, uh, as we're very well aware, hot air rises um, and you find in a room, the warmest air is at the ceiling, the less dense air is at the ceiling. That's true for the oceans as well. The less dense fluid, liquid or gas in the case of the atmosphere. In every natural body of fluid on, on the planet, the less dense stuff is at the top and the heavier stuff, the denser stuff is at the bottom. The oceans are cold at the bottom and warm at the surface, for example. And we know that uh, in those circumstances, you have to do work if you want to redistribute that. It's very important for climate um, and it's important for a whole range of other things. So, I, so I've so i spent my whole career studying those kind of processes. I do lab experiments where we try and model uh, these big scale systems in small scale lab experiments. Uh, and that's, that's kind of been my research interest in fluid mechanics uh, over the last very long time. Yeah. So I guess, it, yes, you've already kind of set up my next uh, uh, question by saying that this uh, hot air rises, because of course, you kind of, you kind of invented the concept of architectural fluid dynamics. So if you could kind of talk about what, what is particularly important for understanding fluid flow in the built environment. Yeah, so obviously we all live in, in houses and, uh, and work in, much of us, most of us spend much of our time indoors. Um, and ventilation of the houses and buildings that we occupy are very important for us, uh, for our health and general comfort and well-being. And um, in the 70s, of course, uh, we were very uh, strongly affected by the oil crisis um, and increase in energy, which I think brought to the fore for the first time, really, the idea of building efficient buildings where you lose, use less energy. And this has become even more important with the awareness of the result of carbon of greenhouse gas emissions and the use of carbon in uh, heating and cooling the urban environment mm -hmm. so i got very interested in this in this topic uh, uh, in in the 80s uh, when we were trying to understand how to make buildings more efficient how to make them uh, better more comfortable for people um, and it's a real challenge because it's very hard to work out where the air goes in a building. If, you're, if people listening, if you think about where your environment is, and as you're sitting by an open window, the chances of you knowing where the air is going in the environment that you're in are probably pretty low. And it's one of the things that's hard to figure out, actually. Uh, it's hard to measure in situ. Um, and so we've, as I said, I do lab experiments and we invented a method which allows us to represent large buildings at full scale in small scale models in the lab where we can study the flow and we can produce mathematical models to describe those flows that we study that enable you to take the results and extrapolate them to large scale buildings, for example. So I've been very interested in, in that topic and it is very much to do with, as you just said, hot air rising. Um, there's a lot of power generated by rising hot air if you can harness it. Um, and, uh, and that's very, very important. And of course, people generate heat internally, buildings generate heat internally through solar gains in the summer, through heating appliances, machinery, occupants, and so on. So if you can harness that and use that energy rather than waste it then of course you can then you can generate um, you can generate uh, much more efficient buildings and what's I think interesting about that is of course there's been a sort of emphasis slightly on making buildings tighter mm. um, and that has implications then for air quality so now we've become much more concerned with pollution uh, and again as I said earlier you know people spend most of their life indoors m many people spend most of their life indoors and we're becoming more and more urbanized as a global community. And so understanding the implications of indoor air pollution and how that plays into the ventilation system, of course, is very important. And that, of course, leads on then to airborne spread of disease, which kind of links into parts of Julia's work as well from that point of view. 
Yeah, so in, in, indeed, the, the uh, dispersion of uh, air, the famous aerosols, the very small droplets that we're all sort of concerned yeah. about. So can you tell us a bit about the, this uh, ramp uh, activity that you're involved in with uh, looking at aerosols? Yeah, so as, as Julia said, this is an initiative sent up by the Royal Society and led by Mike Cates, the Lucasian professor in, in the department. Um, and it was an, a call for volunteers to work uh, on the pandemic from various aspects. And um, I, along with uh, Professor Chris Payne from Imperial College, led uh, one of the tasks which was looking at transmission of uh, aerosols, both the close range uh, and so-called fomite transmission, in other words, droplets landing on surfaces and people touching them and, and being infected, but also longer range airborne uh, transmission um, and so we had uh, about 50 scientists from across the UK working in this area in looking at a whole range of aspects from how you breathe out to how you breathe in, where the air goes in between those two things, how that's affected by the ventilation system, how it's affected by the type of buildings that you're in um, um, and, and so forth. And, and so this was a, a really important study, I think, to try and see what we knew about about these topics and to and to develop as best we could new understandings and new models you know what's the risk of trying to understand questions like what's the risk of catching an infection by walking past someone in the supermarket how does that compare with what happens if you're sitting in a classroom with someone who's infected um, and so on and so forth and um, so so the, the group met uh, in we met over a number of months uh, last year um, and produced a, a quite an extensive publication uh, published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society earlier this year, um, outlining our kind of understanding of these, of these transmission issues. And of course, they are very closely linked up with the ventilation question in terms of buildings. And the, you know, the, risk, of, the risk of infection outdoors, I think, is really very small um, because the atmosphere is much more vigorous and air flows and there's wind blowing and all of that causes dilution but indoors it's really a, a critical issue and in fact I'm in London today uh, because I've been in a school this afternoon putting in monitors to measure carbon dioxide and particulate matter to get an estimate of for both the effectiveness of the ventilation system in this school and the and the typical pollution levels um, so we've installed a bunch of monitors because as I said it's very hard to get information at full scale and so this is one of the projects that I'm currently involved in. And, and, and that gets into a kind of overarching aspect of, the, of your interest, right? So it is about how do we have a sustainable life on this, uh, this planet with good air quality in schools, not the disease, low energy use. All these are, are questions of sustainability. And I guess many people would think that that is a, a discipline of the earth sciences or uh, geography. Um, or perhaps even engineering. So, so what role do mathematicians have to play in, in understanding the sustainability challenge? Well, I, I mean, you're right. And of course, all of these other disciplines do play crucial roles in those questions, um, obviously. And I think one of the one of both the challenges, but also the interest in this whole area is that is to work in an interdisciplinary way. But I think mathematics well provides the language. I mean, it's it's you know, you need numbers, you need to quantify things, you need to be able to make quantifiable estimates of, of implications of actions or predictions about the future scenarios. And mathematics, mathematical models, computer, computer models of, uh, well, we know very well that uh, there are climate models that are produced by mathematicians uh, that uh, make predictions of how the climate will evolve over with various emission scenarios going into the future. So there's a very big role for, for, for mathematicians in this area. I come back to my original point about being fascinated by the oceans, and you'll know this column, of, is that our models of, of how the ocean really works are very crude. Um, and we have to, we have to make, um, we call them parameterizations, but actually they're kind of educated guesses about what happens in many circumstances. And mathematics has a way of trying to, it gives a language for that and enables you to make make systematic progress about things that you don't understand um, and to and to codify them in into an appropriate sort of logical framework so i think mathematics is is a very important part of all of our future um, and certainly will be 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Paul. I think that's, uh, once again, uh, please uh, send in uh, your questions and we'll get to them at the end. But this, this idea about uh, uh, mathematics being the way you appropriately codify uh, questions uh, uh, beautifully connects me to the, my third colleague. Uh, so uh, Carola Bibian Shonli, who is uh, a professor of applied mathematics here in the Damped. Hi, uh, Carola, good, uh, good to see you. Thank you for participating. And my usual first question, but, but, Please tell us a bit about your research interests. So I work on mathematical imaging, which uh, really means developing uh, mathematical theory and methods for image analysis, image processing, inverse imaging problems. So this you know, touches upon uh, solving problems like uh, image denoising, deconvolution, uh, reconstruction of images from indirect measurements, uh, such as they appear, for instance, in computer tomography, where we are not directly measuring an image, but there is some mathematical operation involved to get to an image. Um, segmentation, classification, motion estimation, well, lots of different things. And the, the characterizing factor of the, of the mathematical research that we do is that we um, usually do all of these developments very closely linked to a, a quite broad range of applications. Um, health being a very prominent one, of course, uh, but then also imaging of materials, biological imaging, um, imaging of artwork, of paintings, um, remote sensing of the environment. The beauty of mathematical imaging really is that images appear in lots of different places. So this is what is really exciting to me. And then uh, to add one more thing, in the last uh, couple of years, I got, uh, as I think many of us, really fascinated by deep learning. Uh, and so I've uh, done uh, a lot of work uh, and continue doing on understanding uh, the foundations of deep learning and in particular thinking about methodologies in the context of mathematical imaging to combine deep learning as a data-driven component with more physics-based mathematical modeling uh, of the world. Yeah, so it, there's a lot to, uh, to unpick there. So um, when you're talking about deep learning, I mean, I, I, I think this uh, whole AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, I mean, the, the boundaries between different traditional disciplines are, are breaking down. But what is the mathematician's view of that as opposed to, let's say, somebody who would have the badge of computer science or engineering or, you know, the corporate world? What, what does actually, what's the mathematical sensibility of thinking about these sorts of topics? So if you think about it, deep learning or machine learning in general really is mathematics. <laughs> um, a neural network is, is built of mathematical operations. When you are training it, you're solving uh, a large scale non-convex optimization problem um, and so on. So there is, is full of mathematics. And Actually, just early on, a, more, a bit more than two hours ago, I gave, I gave a talk at the Alan Turing Institute Cambridge um, engagement event, talking about using mathematics to uncover uh, some of the inner workings of deep neural networks. Because the fact is, we really don't understand at the moment why they work as well as they do. And so, you know, lots of questions like, if you think about expressivity, um, why, which network architectures work better than others, which classes of functions, for instance, can we approximate with a given network. Uh, this touches upon concepts in approximation theory, applied harmonic analysis, questions about the training, now that we talked about, you know, large scale optimization problems, of course, this touches upon optimization, optimal control, numerical analysis, questions around explainability. Um, why does the network actually provide us the answer that it provides us with? Uh, how sensitive is it to the input? Which components in the input are actually important for the output? All of these questions um, touch upon um, uncertainty quantification. How certain are we in uh, the, the, the answer that we get from the network, information theory, and so on and so forth? And so there is a lot there um, that mathematics 
needs to answer and is crucial actually uh, that we can answer these questions. So to, you know, we did say at the beginning we're an applied uh, uh, department. So, so to, just to, you mentioned two applications. So you mentioned in health, which is, I guess, the general theme of this. So, so what, what's your research interest and your activity in that area? So possibly first and foremost, um, medical imaging. So medical imaging is really full of super tough uh, mathematical problems. And I usually, I always like to talk about the biomedical imaging pipeline. If you think about, um, uh, first of all, the imaging data being acquired, there is a lot of mathematics in there already in the decision of which data should we acquire about the patient in the first place to answer a certain question. Once, once we have decided which data, which modality, let's say, which imaging modality we choose, MRI, CT, for instance, um, how do we acquire this data in the best way? There is a degree of freedom of how we can tune these measurements. And once we have the measurements, and as I said at the very beginning, these measurements are most typically in medical imaging, not uh, directly an image. How do we get uh, the best image uh, out of this? Uh, and the best image then again depends on the task we want to solve on this image, either uh, to best uh, inform a clinician or radiologist who is looking at this image to uh, make a diagnosis or a prognosis, or indeed if the image goes into another algorithm like uh, segmentation or a classification algorithm that, uh, that gives us more information about the prognosis of this uh, patient, for instance, how likely is this uh, individual to develop Alzheimer's disease or something like that, then uh, uh, there is also a lot of more quantification steps involved. Um, and all of this it contains a lot of mathematics. And so this is one of the main interests that I have um, in health. Um, more generally, uh, I'm uh, collaborating a lot with a statistician in Cambridge, uh, John Aston, who works in DIPOMS in the Pure Math and Mathematics Statistics Department. And so together with him, uh, we are uh, uh, directing uh, the Cambridge uh, Mathematics of Information and Healthcare Center, which uh, really brings together mathematicians, statisticians, uh, clinicians, medical researchers to develop, very broadly speaking, data analysis techniques uh, for healthcare data, from imaging data to electronic health records to uh, laboratory data, and so on and so forth. So that's what I what I'm interested in, and that's and what I'm thinking. It, 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 it's it's just is so amazing, and and it. You know, connects with the overarching theme of the, the other discussions. But of course, there was one thing that just uh, leapt out of the other list of things you said: paintings. You know, what is what is uh, what is the mathematics of paintings? Can you tell us a bit about that? So, I mean, the beauty of mathematics really is um, the level of abstraction that we can that we can use. Uh, or the, the tool of abstraction that we can that we can use, and uh, so this is the same for mathematical imaging. Um, mathematical methods for let's say denoising an image that we can use on a CT image on a medical image, uh, we can in a with a with very little effort or even directly apply to an image of a painting. Um, and so um, this is why the range of applications I'm working on is so is so diverse. And so um, art restoration, digital art restoration and digital art analysis is one uh, very active uh, area of research uh, that I have in my research group. And uh, so here we are collaborating with uh, art historians and conservators in the Fitzwilliam Museum uh, in Cambridge. Uh, to uh, develop um, mathematical methods for art restoration. I mean, so just to give you an example, I think one of our most prominent uh, pieces of work that we have done was to work on illuminated manuscripts. Illuminated manuscripts are special since they're usually not physically restored. They're very fragile and so a restorer would not touch them. Um, but you can image them and you can image them with uh, various scientific imaging tools as well that the Fitzwilliam Museum has uh, purchased in the last couple of years. And so uh, the most, 
I, I would say spotlight work that we did a couple of years ago was an, on an illuminated manuscript uh, from the 16th uh, century. Um, uh, that uh, is a children's book, uh, a primer that was uh, commissioned by um, um, uh, by the by Queen Anne of Brittany in 1505 for her uh, five-year-old daughter Claude uh, to teach her the alphabet as well as uh, tell the biblical story of creation. So meaning that there were illuminations of the letters in the alphabet, as well as Adam and Eve and paradise and these, you know, different, um, uh, different scenarios that, that, uh, that make up uh, the story. And um, uh, so originally as Adam and Eve has, have, if, if they have uh, been in paradise, um, have been naked. Uh, a later owner, though, uh, that this book passed through um, has overpainted uh, Adam and Eve and have given them little skirts, um, quite crudely, I have to say. Uh, and so the art historians knew that for a while, uh, and they also then confirmed it more recently with infrared imaging, which allows you to look through the, the visible layers of paint. And then they approached us. I, I gave a talk about art restoration that I did uh, before actually coming to Cambridge um, at uh, Lucy Cavendish College. And they came and they saw that and they challenged us to help us with, the, with this particular digital manuscript. And indeed we helped them. We used both the infrared image, so the structures, the anatomical structures we saw through the layers of paint together with the visible color and texture uh, in the photograph uh, outside of the skirt to basically propagate color and texture along this anatomical structure into the overpainted region. And this was uh, so successful that we, we also exhibited this uh, at the Fitzwilliam Museum at the color exhibition a couple of years ago. And this led to many more collaborative projects between us. So it's a very, very exciting field. Well, fantastic. It's a beautiful uh, example, as you say, of the abstraction of mathematics that can be applied to all these different uh, uh, areas. So thank you so much, uh, Carola. So maybe we could have uh, everybody's um, uh, cameras uh, back on and we, we can now enter the uh, Q&A uh, part of the uh, session. And please do keep giving us uh, questions. I have various uh, screens here that hopefully we'll be able to share um, the different questions that are coming through. So the first uh, question uh, uh, for you, Julia. Um, what do you think are the best ways of explaining the results and consequences of your work to the public and the media? Well, what we faced recently has been particularly uh, difficult because it's been so uh, super, super political. And on top of that, that means it's been left to the political journalists often who really are, uh, have struggled to digest the live uh, science going on, understandably. I think my top point on that would be to make sure the right expertise is behind the communication uh, of what we're doing. Um, so um, with us, uh, as I've mentioned, you know, we've had the plus editors, Rachel and Marianne, actually as part of our meetings, listening to our preliminary results and then drafting things and being able to talk directly with us to make sure that's communicated. Another way is when we've got um, a really key paper coming out, we will arrange a press briefing on it with the Science Media Centre. So we'll have a, a press briefing, I've decided what we're going to say, we've written a press statement and be ready to answer questions directly. Um, and then, then it's about, you know, each of us have our own way of doing this. For me, I'm not desperately happy to be too much in the media and certainly not on TV news, but some of my colleagues have found that they are actually happy to do that directly. Um, me, maybe my niche is more giving talks for general wider audience where I've got time to go into the, into the detail a little bit. So we've all got our own ways, but I think top thing is get the right expertise behind the communications. Yes. And that's something that you're particularly interested in. I, I mean, like the, the Rosalind Franklin uh, uh, Award that you had, right? That, that's all about uh, getting your message out uh, to the community. It's a long-standing interest and I've, I've worked with, particularly with Merlion Maths projects for a, a lot of years. So yeah, we've been very lucky to have that to hand as well. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, and then another quite interesting question here. So um, in wartime, uh, the technology applied to arms accelerates. And is there an analogy that you can draw in the COVID pandemic, have you seen that the modelling techniques have advanced rapidly? Well, there's lots of analogies to be made with wartime and what we've been through with the pandemic modelling. Um, 
certainly, I think early on, I think what SPYM pre COVID had this idea of is there would be the one influenza model, pandemic influenza, maybe an opposition model. So there'd be one or two main models and we'd use those to answer everything. I think now we've understood that in the face of a pandemic, you use all kinds of things. So we've got the very detailed models which are there for the predictions, for example, for the roadmap work. And the other end of the scale is actually almost me with my eigenvectors, right? So if that will do the job to answer the question we've got, we will do that. So the idea of just being able to use any approach is rather different to what we went in with. I think I'm going to be honest, the painful one for my field, and there was a problem with my field beforehand in terms of uh, code sharing, code reproducibility. That's one which um, post wartime isn't going to be the same. We, we can't just go off and make our own bonkers code. You can see this a bit already. So all the all the main models that are contributing to SPIM and Sage now uh, are out there. You can find what they're doing. They've got GitHub re repositories with all the updates. Um, and this was again a problem because we were a small field with a limited capacity um, before. And this has got to change. We've, we've got to do things in a very different way in future. It's painful, but it's true. Um, but perhaps the question you didn't ask about wartime analogy, but um, and isn't obvious from outside is who is doing the science, right? So if you look at what happened in the Second World War of what it meant for who was doing the science in universities, particularly women coming into science, there were big changes. Again, this pandemic has brought big changes for us. It's not obvious, but there is a huge age range of people working on things. The gender balance has shifted, uh, certainly in my field over this time. There's been a lot of my colleagues who have been on parental leave at some point during this pandemic, have worked up until they need to go on leave, and I've been able to come back into things. Um, a lot of my colleagues have had caring responsibilities and yet have managed to stay connected because we don't need to be somewhere in person. We don't need to fly uh, to another country to do this. We're working together online collaboratively. And apart from some of the meetings, we can do a lot of what we do at odd hours using online systems. And I suppose this meeting also is an example of online systems can connect us up in different ways. So other analogies there with wartime. Sure. That, that, that's, that, that's great. <laughs> really great. So moving to Paul, uh, you know, it's the next question on my, uh, on my iPad. Can you say a bit more about the theoretical models behind your work on buildings? Yes, I can. And of course, as sort of Julia was hinting, I think um, there's a whole range of such models from uh, very detailed computational models that uh, um, try and capture the details of the airflow at very small scales and with in great detail and, and resolved in time to models that are actually much more broad brush and sort of tell you things like, if you double the size of your window, you'll get X benefit or X change in the, in the ventilation or something. So there's a whole range of these models. And I think, again, one of the things that's come out of this work is that we have really been using all of these to try and come up with answers relatively quickly over this last year and a half. Uh, to try and deal with the with the sort of pandemic questions, um, and I and and I I think I, to to sort of also reflect on Julia's comments about about developments. I think you know one of the things that I said earlier is it's very hard to get real data, and perhaps one of the real benefits of this uh, of this pandemic is that we are actually collecting data about infections and how this might occur, and this is you know will help the science. So of course you don't want this to happen, but given that it does, I think it's it provides an opportunity to take the, the subject forward. Great, great Paul. And I think this uh, raise it connects very well with another question about you know that there's a flow of data, large amounts of flow of data, and how we use that. So Carola, what's your view on on how data analytics uh, and the mathematics underlying it uh, will be? Um, or might augment or change the way that uh, healthcare professionals work. The, the particular example the questioner mentions is radiologists in their decision making. I think the most powerful aspect of using um, mathematical data analysis uh, for health data uh, is that it can, on the one hand, capture what maybe you know clinicians and radiologists capture by their experience it can capture information from a very large um, cohort of individuals. Um, 
And then it can capture this information, not just from one type of data, but it can look at various different data types at once uh, in an integrated fashion. And so this is something that really goes beyond human capabilities. Um, and that's really the potential. I don't uh, see these type of methodologies uh, work uh, in isolation uh, to clinicians, radiologists. I do think uh, the interaction uh, between uh, the algorithms and the actual medical experts is crucial for uh, asking these algorithms also the right questions. Uh, this is why our the research that we do in this context is extremely tightly linked to clinicians because they need to tell us what they're asking from the data. We, we don't know, and these algorithms don't know either. So um, I do see a very, very powerful relationship, companionship between um, AI, data analysis methods in the clinic, in medical research uh, with the actual medical researchers and clinicians. Thank you. So I, I guess this, this is a, a question to all three of you really. So in, in, in our conversations, we talked very much about the multidisciplinary nature of, of your work and collaboration with other people within Cambridge and other institutions in the UK. And a very interesting question has come in about international collaboration. So, so how do you think, uh, international collaboration works and what is it like in its uh, in the future? I see Julia nodding, so maybe she can start. Of, of course, international collaborations on this started with the networks that we had, right? So very yeah. early on, I was on calls with my former PhD supervisor, who's at Princeton now, sort of comparing notes and seeing what's going on, what do we know? Um, so a lot of that happened informally, and actually also with my former PhD student who's in, who's in Harvard and um, you know, again, some of his early work was really super important in this pandemic. But for us, the next interesting thing that happened was the Isaac Newton Institute. I'd normally say is next door, but it's next door to the math faculty. is is, is part of um, Cambridge Maths. It was very important. Had a program um, infectious disease of pandemics, and that brought uh, together international researchers. Um, so that was really important for us to connect up with what was going on and uh, to share thinking. Uh, most recent bit of that that was important was the uh, we had a program on evolutionary consequences of vaccination in, on the international scale so super important yeah and, and Carola you're just about to be involved in a, in a program at the, the Isaac Newton Institute so. yeah indeed I mean this program is on the mathematics of deep learning and it actually starts next week so <laughs> it's uh, it's very topical <laughs> um, and that lives from international exchange, international collaboration. Um, there are not um, that many uh, mathematicians yet who uh, have worked on, you know, on the mathematics behind deep learning um, very intensively. So, so they are spread all over the globe. So we need to bring them together to make progress. And if I could comment, I, I mean, I agree entirely with, with Julia that we've built on our existing networks and I think we all have quite extensive international collaborations which we've built up over the years um, either from our own moving around or other people visiting Cambridge in particular I suppose it's a big magnet um, and, and it has been an international effort in many respects and I, I do think that that science is, is a collab science and mathematics is a collaborative process it's very rarely that we compete with each other we actually work together I think in a way that's probably unique in sort of global affairs, I would say. And I think it's one of the great hopes of humankind is that we, uh, that we continue to do this. And, and the pandemic itself is, it has been a shared problem and we've shared information, I think, uh, very, very freely across, across the nations. Yeah. So, so yes, you, you say it's a, a, this sort of activity, mathematics can be the hope, the future hope of uh, humanity, but there's also the, I guess, the aspect of the, the future generations uh, 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 that we need to enthuse with mathematics. And, and one of the questions, once again, back to Julia, so that you've mentioned the Millennium Maths Project uh, a few times. Could you tell us a bit more about, about what this program has been doing? 
Colm, I don't need to tell you what it is. No, but, I know, but, but for the audience, need to tell 300 um, people. <laughs> it's, a, it's a large programme, which is about maths, education, outreach, communication, partly for children and partly for a wider audience. Um, some of the key bits of it, I've talked about Plus magazine, uh, which produces articles on all sorts of things, not just uh, pandemics, don't worry. Um, and another part that's been really important during this pandemic is Enrich, that's produced um, lots of resources uh, for different school years, school groups, and um, that's mattered because it can be tied into the syllabus and the curriculum and, and used alongside there. The thing which I haven't done, which I would have been doing if it wasn't a pandemic, was using the, the um, grant from the Franklin Awards to make some resources to think about infectious disease modelling alongside syllabus so it could be used actually in maths lessons rather than extracurricular. So that's the sort of thing Millennium Maths Project does. Very good. Yes, uh, and, and it's part of the... As the I said, I, I was at a school this afternoon installing yeah. monitors and we're actually you know, engaging both the teachers and the students in the results of this so that they see that learn about their environment they learn about how you collect data how you analyze data we're very keen as educators i'm sure we all are very keen to have as many bright young students get interested in the subject or in science in general and mathematics uh, and so it, it there are opportunities uh, which you can make out of out of these uh, rather difficult circumstances fortunately yeah and and that's part of you know our, our our interest in in being evangelists for mathematics you know create we've talked a lot about the the research but there's also of course the teaching uh, component that's uh, right at the heart of what we uh, do and developing the the future generation so i guess uh, paul you did um, mention how you how you got into uh, uh, being interested in oceanography by by surfing it seems a perfectly <laughs> uh, excellent uh, reason but uh, but uh, another question was also you know, you, we've talked about these really cool uh, applications, but how did you actually get into them? So, 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 what attracted you, Carola, to your to your particular bit of mathematics? For me, it was a PDE. It was a, a, a particular um, differential equations that I was studying uh, during my PhD. I did my PhD in applied partial differential equations and nonlinear PDEs. And one of these uh, equations that I studied, uh, which was originally um, uh, proposed for material sciences for modeling phase separation and coarsening and binary alloys, turned out to have uh, wonderful applications and image processing for image interpolation for image inpainting, which, by the way, has again connections to what I talked about for the illuminated yeah. manuscripts. And that just fascinated me. And then I never let go. Um, and I have a very functional analysis differential equations had uh, usually where here and and this is my perspective but um yeah so imaging is ri is rich of, of various different mathematical areas this is another nice thing uh, about it um optimization um, um harmonic analysis uh statistics of course convex analysis um machine learning so this is uh, this yeah this is this is but this is how I got into imaging yeah right. very good and and Julia why flu oh that was because of the strains and the strains because I was into disease modelling but mm. there's an endless stream of chance things but the, the pivotal one was when I was a part three student so I was, I was into dynamical systems and fluids basically I had no idea that mathematical biology was even a thing. Um, and we've been asked to look at a bit of the textbook by Jim Murray on mathematical biology. And I think we're supposed to read the chapter on stripy animals, but I didn't. I don't know why. Did I, did I go to the wrong chapter or I just found something more? I read the chapter on epidemics instead. And I remember being sort of kind of cross with it because there's no way you can use simple equations to model something that complex. And yeah, the, I was hooked at that point. Very good. That sounds uh, so. That does seem to be quite on message to also bring up uh, uh, the, the fascination of uh, an interesting course in part three, putting you in a particular uh, direction. So I, I think um, I, I see the clock is ticking towards uh, uh, um, the hour, and uh, we had sort of promised we'd we'd do that. So I certainly have enjoyed uh, listening to my uh, colleagues talk about their interesting work. 
And uh, to flag up, we will continue both uh, in Dampt and in Dippums and sometimes together, we intend to do uh, these uh, events uh, um, three or four times a, a year, highlighting different aspects of research and also the teaching and also the, um, uh, the activities that go on in this uh, particular department, uh, the pair of departments in uh, mathematics in, in Cambridge. So, of course, we uh, uh, face uh, uh, challenges. We always want uh, to have more brilliant students coming along to come in. We want uh, uh, the Millennium uh, Math Project to go from uh, uh, strength to strength and also to attract as many students as possible to come and take our, our wonderful courses. But we're very uh, glad to have spent this last um, uh, hour with you listening to us talk about uh, uh, what we uh, are so fortunate to be uh, working on, uh, on on mathematics and how it uh, can be applied in, into the, the new areas uh, that once you have the underpinning of mathematics, it can go and help and, and give insight in so many different uh, important areas. So thank you to my three colleagues. Thank you very much uh, uh, to uh, the uh, alumni, uh, um, Kudar, uh, Cambridge University Development and Alumni Relations, in particular Megan Anir, who uh, uh, pulled this uh, event uh, together. And thank you uh, to the audience for your uh, attention. I certainly have enjoyed this. I hope you have too. So, good night.